Um, welcome, everybody. We have a wonderful program for you today um, on the uh, the case between uh, Fordham University and uh, the hate group Students for Justice in Palestine. I'm featuring uh, Susan Tuckman, who is ZOA's Director of Special Projects and a real uh, ZOA hero. Um, to, Susan uh, led the six-year battle to uh, change the uh, regulations regarding the Civil Rights Act uh, to include Jewish students, protections for Jewish students. And we have Peter Fishkind. Peter Fishkind wrote the brief uh, for uh, Proskauer and ISGAP uh, on this case. And Susan Tuckman uh, wrote ZOA's uh, amicus brief in this case. Um, often uh, we're doing this partially as a book club event because often when you write a brief, a uh, legal brief, it feels like uh, you could have written a book. Um, and the briefs, uh, this the books this time are the briefs written by Susan and Peter. And without further ado, I'll um, let Susan take over and uh, speak about uh, speak about the case. Thank you, Liz, and welcome to everybody here with us today. I'm the director of the ZOA Center for Law and Justice. Um, and a lot of my work at the ZOA has to do with fighting campus anti-Semitism. I'm pretty sure everybody or most of everybody on this call is, is very familiar with the fact that campus anti-Semitism is a huge problem today and it has been for years. Um, we work at ZOA very closely with students on campuses all across the United States. And we know firsthand that students are being threatened, harassed, intimidated, simply because they are proud Jews and they are proudly expressing their Jewish identity by supporting the state of Israel. In our experience at ZOA, the the harassment and the intimidation is coming primarily from a group that calls itself Students for Justice in Palestine, or SJP for short. And there are SJP chapters at hundreds of colleges and universities across the country. Um, to my knowledge, the only school that has rejected an SJP club is Fordham University. And that decision by Fordham led to a lawsuit, which is what we're gonna be discussing today. I'm gonna give you the basics of the suit. Um, the suit came about after a small group of students at Fordham University, this was back in 2015, applied to establish an official SJP club at Fordham's Lincoln Center campus. And this group of students followed the protocol. They submitted a, a constitution. They submitted documentation, all of the paperwork uh, that was required uh, to submit in support of their application. Uh, they met with the Fordham student government representatives. They met with various Fordham University administrators. They answered questions. They provided supplementary information. All of this was done consistent with Fordham policies. These students made it clear in the application process that they were gonna affiliate with National SJP. They were asked and answered that they were going to keep the Students for Justice in Palestine name for their club. So they went through this process. The Duke student government approved SJP as a club, but for him, for him, for him. The, ultimate, for the ultimate say, the ultimate say uh, was with the Dean of Students. The university's policies were clear that the Dean of Students had the right to veto any student club. Well, the Dean of Students did his homework in this case. He really did. Um, he reviewed the application materials. He spoke with students. He spoke with staff. He spoke with faculty. And he did a very detailed assessment of how SJP was operating on other campuses. And after he did this extensive review, the Dean of Students concluded that um, an SJP club uh, would be in his, in his view, based on his review, based on his analysis, 
it was going to be polarizing on the Fordham campus. And he said that an SJP club would be contrary to the mission of the university to encourage open debate and mutual understanding. So he rejected the SJP club. The student applicants responded to this decision by filing a lawsuit in New York State Supreme Court. This was back in 2017. And in essence, their legal claim was that Fordham University's decision to deny official recognition to an SJP club was arbitrary, it was capricious, and it was uh, inconsistent with the university's policies. And the applicants asked the court to annul the decision of the university and to compel the university to recognize SJP as an official club. Fordham University responded in the lawsuit by moving to dismiss the case and submitted evidence that showed that the decision to reject an SJP club was based, it was a rational decision, it was a reasonable decision, and it was based purely and consistently on university policies. The policies were followed. The judge in the case sided with the SJP applicants and ordered Fordham University to recognize SJP as an official student club. Fordham responded by filing an appeal with the appellate division. And it was at that point that ZOA and other groups, including the group that Peter's going to speak about later, all of us filed what are called amicus briefs with the appellate division. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, an amicus is, is it's a friend to the court. An amicus is not actually a party to the case, but we have an interest in the case. We care about how the case is going to be decided. And in our amicus briefs, we provide the court with our insights and our information that bear on the issues that the court is going to be deciding. So we filed a brief. Peter's organization filed a brief and many other groups did, some in favor of SJP and some in favor of, of Fordham. Our brief supported Fordham's decision. Um, we, our goal in our brief was to show that Fordham's decision was not only rational, it was the right decision. It was a decision that would protect the safety and well-being of students on the campus. And what we did was, and I, and I encourage you to read our brief, if you haven't already, we provided example after example of situations where this group SJP not only threatened and harassed and intimidated Jewish and pro-Israel students, the group shut down and disrupted Jewish and pro-Israel events and speakers, intimidated students and engaged in activity that not only legitimized violence against Jews, but celebrated violence against Jews. And if, if you're familiar with ZOA's work, many of the examples that we talk about in the brief are examples that we know about firsthand because we worked with the students in those situations. Um, Many of you may know that we have a long history of fighting anti-Semitism at the University of California at Irvine. Um, our work there with students goes back to 2004. And in our brief, we talk about some of the many, many problems that Jewish students have faced at UC Irvine at the hands of SJP. And I'll, I'll just give you one example, um, which we talk about in the brief. Uh, there was an event that was sponsored um, at UC Irvine where they were going to screen a documentary that talked about the lives of soldiers in the Israel Defense Forces. And everyone was allowed to come to this event. Um, and SJP certainly could have come to the event to uh, raise issues, ask tough questions, disagree with whatever was being presented in the documentary. But instead, SJP really did what, what I think was terrorize uh, the individuals ha who had the right to attend this screening. 
uh, SJP members were screaming uh, outside the room, banging on the doors, blocking exits so that terrified students couldn't even escape to safety. And Jewish students there actually feared for their lives based on what SJP members were doing. Many of you will be familiar with the work that ZOA has done at the City University of New York. Um, we talk about many of the situations that we dealt with there, trying to help Jewish students who are being threatened and harassed at some of the CUNY schools. And I'll give you one of the many examples that we talk about in our brief. Um, a few years ago, there was a rally that, um, that students organized uh, to protest rising tuition, which is a very, very legitimate concern. SJP turned this rally into a frightening attack on Jews. We worked with Jewish students who attended this rally and SJP members and SJP allies were at this rally screaming things like death to Jews, Jews out of CUNY. And we know firsthand from the students who work with us that they were actually physically afraid for their physical safety. Now, if you talk to members of SJP, they will tell you, oh, we're not against Jews. We, we reject anti-Semitism. We distinguish between uh, anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. But if you look at the way that SJP acts on campus after campus, and we show this in our brief, SJP goes after Jews, period, on issues that have nothing to do with Israel, that have nothing to do with securing justice for the Palestinian, Palestinian Arab people. And I'll give you just a couple of examples that we talk about in our brief. Um, at Northeastern University in Boston and at Columbia University, Jewish students organized events for Holocaust Remembrance Day. And instead of being respectful, SJP deliberately disrupted those events. In addition to the examples that we know of firsthand, our brief also talks about empirical studies that show that SJP helps to create a hostile environment for Jewish students. And I'll just give you one, one of the examples that we talk about. Um, back in 2015 and 2016, Brandeis University did two related studies on campus anti-Semitism. And the first study, the, the, the basic re result of the first study, the basic conclusion uh, was just to uh, confirm how prevalent on North American campuses, so this included the United States and Canada, how prevalent anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiment is on North American campuses. The follow-up study by Brandeis University, which was issued in 2016, focused on what they called the hotspots of anti-Semitism, where the problems were most prevalent on what campuses. And one of the major findings of this 2016 study, and this is a quote, one of the strongest predictors of perceiving a hostile climate toward Israel and Jews is the presence of an active SJP chapter on campus. So even this empirical study shows that SJP creates a hostile environment for students who are Jewish and who support the state of Israel. There's so much more information in ZOA's amicus brief to the appellate division that I, I really encourage you to read. Um, I want to just go back to the procedure of the actual case. The appellate division decided Fordham's appeal in 2020. And I'm happy to report to you that the appellate division found in favor of Fordham University. Uh, the court concluded that the decision by the university to reject an SJP club was a rational decision, a reasonable decision, and was an exercise of 
Fordham's honest discretion. The SJP applicants in the case who, who lost this appeal did not have an automatic right to appeal the appellate division's decision. Uh, they had to get permission to appeal to the highest court in New York. They did request permission. Their request was denied. And so as it stands to this day, Fordham's decision to reject any job um, that, that's, that's the, that's the decision and there is no SJP at Fordham. Um, in my view, it's the right decision. Uh, in my view, Fordham prioritized the safety and well-being of the campus community, um, instead of allowing a, an anti-Semitic hate group like SJP to, to, to poison the environment and make it a toxic and potentially even dangerous environment. Um, I, you know, I, I feel grateful to Fordham that it set this very important precedent for other colleges and universities to, to follow. And I, I really feel proud that ZOA was able to play a role uh, in this legal case. Thank you very much for you know that really excellent discussion of the case. I'm going to now turn to um, to Peter Fishkind to tell us about his role in the case. And uh, with, without further ado, Peter, please uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, and thank you, Susan, for that um, detailed overview of the case. And it was a pleasure to get to know you during this process. Um, I have a couple things um, that I want to expand upon that, that Susan referenced in her discussion and also to talk about um, my role and our client's role in this case. Um, the first thing that really occurred to us when this matter really hit the news um, was something Susan referenced that it's our understanding this is the only university in the United States to take this sort of a stand against SJP. And we felt that it was particularly important, both my colleagues at Proskauer, as well as our client ISGAP, um, to show support uh, from the Jewish community for uh, a university that was willing to take this stance. We did, for what it's worth, find it interesting that this was a Jesuit institution um, that made this decision, um, rather than certain other institutions that have more um, sort of Jewish uh, lineage and uh, association and leadership um, at those institutions. And for that reason, we, we again, we felt it was particularly important to show that there was a Jewish community that was willing to support um, the institution in taking this step. Um, so Susan uh, gave a great overview of the procedure of the case. Um, so I'm not going to dwell too much on that. Um, we similarly came in um, when the case was before the appellate division to uh, submit our brief. Um, something that I also want to um, sort of add upon was, um, again, Sus Susan noted that the dean had this, uh, did, did his research, so to speak. I mean, there were uh, hundreds of pages of, of a record on this case. Um, he collected information from news sources. He met with um, various different constituent groups within Fordham, both for and against the creation of the club that included Jewish students. There was a Jewish student association. It included a number of faculty members, including um, one particular member that was, I forget her title, but I believe she was the Jewish studies professor or something of the sort. Um, and what he uh, eventually did is he, he came to this sort of written statement where he informed the um, SJP chapter of his decision to not move forward with the club. And um, again, it, it, it was our view that this wasn't his intention to write sort of his decision, so to speak, when he was informing them of this. But this was then used um, by the lower court that decided against Fordham as, again, this written decision that this was the reason he came to this. And that's what he was stuck with um, in terms of putting forth his, his reasoning. And while um, you know, my feeling is clearly that SJP uses anti-Semitic tactics, has numerous you know, anti-Semitic views such as BDS and the like, um, the word anti-Semitism didn't come into that, that statement. It really focused, at least by its words alone, on the breakdown of discourse on campus. 
And as Susan noted, you know, a common SJP tactic is to shut down an event. Um, you know, BDS from its and the, the student group put together their charter. They explicitly included BDS to be an SJP chapter. Um, you have to take up certain principles, including support for BDS in your formation of a chapter. Um, and you know, from his research, it, it was clear that there was just ample evidence that creating this club on campus, whether someone thinks that they're anti-Semitic or not, would disrupt campus life in a way that was not cohesive to the sort of campus that Fordham wanted to create. Um, and this was made extremely clear again in the record, not just by what was said by the dean in his final uh, statement on the matter to the proposed club, um, but also by the fact that he actually offered the group um, the opportunity to move forward with some sort of pro-Palestinian club, so long as they didn't take up the SJP name and advocate for BDS. Um, and that to us made this such a slam dunk case. And it was really so surprising that the lower, lower courts decided against Fordham um, because the dean really had um, near unilateral discretion to come to a conclusion that this wasn't good for his campus and he didn't want it on his campus because it would disrupt uh, discourse and sort of the free and fair exchange of ideas. Um, and again, this, this record was very strong on that point. And even before we reached the question of, um, you know, is SJP anti-Semitic? And in our uh, brief, we made that uh, clear argument, even though in our view, you know, Fordham didn't focus on that as much as they focused on the, the, um, the discourse issue. Um, and we, like ZOA, were able to offer broader context to the court to explain um, the nature of SJP, the types of activities they've been involved with. You know, Susan referenced um, uh, an incident at CUNY and, and their experience at, uh, at UC Irvine. Um, there was also a truly just a, you know, heinous incident at NYU that, if I'm not mistaken, was in the record where um, uh, SJP had posted mock eviction notices on student dorm rooms uh, to sort of, you know, say that, you know, Israel is evicting Palestinians from their homes and settlements. And they picked one particular dorm uh, for this, and they picked a dorm with Shabbos elevators at NYU. So again, you know, we saw time and time again, both in, in the record and in the broader context that we were able to argue that there's this very clear argument that SJP is indeed anti-Semitic, but even if someone's not willing to go that far, that they are, you know, a, a enormously divisive and unproductive uh, group on a campus, and that if a dean comes to a decision that he doesn't want the sort of activity coming up on campus, um, that he is, you know, well in his right to do so, and for the lower court to have found that this was arbitrary, capricious, just simply didn't pass muster for us. Um, and again, you know, seeing sort of the unique nature of this case, we wanted to uh, take a stand um, uh, in support of Fordham. And we were, you know, very pleased to have um, uh, ZOA write a brief. Um, stand with us also wrote a brief. And there were a couple other organizations in support um, that, that, that came out here. Um, and, you know, it's I, I think campus organizing is now in a weird place. I don't even know what's happening at other campuses with formation of clubs to the extent that they're not you know, gathering in full force. Um, but it will be interesting going forward to see whether, you know, other uh, deans try to make this kind of decision. Um, I just don't know that we've gotten to see whether, you know, this uh, case has those kinds of legs quite yet, because I would just gather to imagine that typical campus organizing isn't happening in the same way. Um, um, but again, you know, this was really a pleasure for, for me to work on, for my colleagues at Proskauer and for ISCAP, um, to be supportive of. So with that, I'm happy to turn it over, uh, to the audience for questions for, for myself or for Susan. Thank you very much, Peter, for that excellent presentation. Um, we're going to turn it over to questions and answers. Um, I do want to read to everybody, by the way, the appellate division statement deciding in favor of Fordham. Uh, the conclusion, which I have also posted in the chat, uh, which is that respondents, that's Fordham's conclusion, that the proposed club, which would have been affiliated with the national organization, reported to have engaged in disruptive and coercive actions on other campuses, would work against rather than 
enhance respondents' commitment to open dialogue and mutual learning and understanding was not without a sound basis in reason and is was ta- or taken without regard to the facts. So it's very interesting that the uh, appellate court uh, really took notice of the course of actions uh, pointed and which of course were pointed out in the amicus briefs as well as by forum the course of actions of of uh, SJP and that was a, an important part of the decision. Um, okay, so let me uh, turn to questions. I see Eric Selkov. Do you have an, any thought that this can be repeated on other campuses? And do you, are you working with any other campuses now? And then the second question had to do with using against our groups. As you probably know, students uh, supporting Israel, SSI, was uh, not allowed on Duke camp, Duke's campus. And I'm wondering, even though I don't see any analogy, they're not a hateful group, they're just supporting Israel. Can this decision be used against our group, SSI, in other campuses, is that a fear you have? So if you could talk a little about, you know, the future of this case affecting future uh, activities on other campuses, can you help it? Yeah, with that question? Okay, so either either Peter or Susan, you know, or both, feel free to take the question. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Start. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have be, be happy to respond. Um, so on the question of, um, you know, can this be replicated productively for for our you know supportive uh, schools? Uh, I think the answer is clearly yes. Um, you need an administrator like Dean Eldridge, who is the dean at Fordham, to take the stand first. Um, I think that it's likely that this has been a bit short circuited again by COVID, just because I I don't think that student clubs are meeting in the same way that they were in the past, and therefore. You know, the notion that you're going to get a particularly disruptive uh, club unless someone's going to, you know, join a Zoom, you know, um, unproductively, um, you know, isn't isn't happening as much. So, you know, hopefully COVID will pass and groups will you know go back to normal and then we'll really see the legs of this. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the appellate division case came out, you know, well into 2020. So we were already in the pandemic and we haven't seen again, you know, uh, the opportunity to sort of resume normal life, especially on campuses that for the most part have been very restrictive of of gatherings. Um, To the question of whether this can be used against us, um, I think the answer there is clearly yes, Um, especially in terms of, you know, votes uh, in student governments and things like that. You know, I don't think the attention to detail, um, whether it's good faith or just, um, Ignorance is going to go into the distinctions between a group like SSI and a group like SJP. Um, I think that a lot of, um, you know, a student senator or something like that, they're going to see, oh, so, you know, they're banning the pro-Palestinian groups and let's, you know, we're in favor of the Palestinians, so let's ban the pro-Israel groups. Um, I think that our goal in these cases should be to uh, make the argument, especially to the administrators at the school, Um, because it's just very difficult to fight battles in student senates all over, um, to say, you know, the clear distinction here is the types of things, number one, that SJP is advocating for and make that case in a strong way. But number two, and I think the hook, line, and sinker is, I've never heard of any incident with an SSI group disrupting, you know, a pro-Palestinian event or anything like that. And to me, that's the clearest distinction that anyone can understand. You know, you don't need to read... Uh, you know, novels about the, the evils of BDS, like, you know, we put together in our briefs. Um, but you can just see from these instances on campuses, and there are videos of, of many of them, of, you know, the desire to shut down discourse um, and administrators, um, you know, they're going to they're gonna pay attention to that, in my view. Um, so I think that's the strongest argument for us. Um, but I do think it's a real fear, not the one that we should back away from, but it is a real fear that, you know, there's going to be repercussions for pro-Israel organizing on campus now. Yeah, I think Peter, just, just to follow up on that, one quick thing. In Duke, there was no physical actions. If you know the case, they they took some uh, texts that were on social media and they, it, you know, took it out of context and just blew it up. And, and that's, you know what happened at Duke. That, that, that's what scares me. Yeah. So I, I did follow that a bit. Um, so the vote though was in the student Senate to now, you know, disband the club. Right. I mean, are they now, 
you know, ineligible from the university to receive funding. Um, you know, that that's yeah, they, they like, weren't allowed as a club. And it was actually brought up to the, uh, the, the chancellor, whatever the head of Duke was, and and they didn't uh, overturn it. So they're not allowed anymore at Duke. Well, well, always been involved it, with that. You know, it, it, we, yeah, we're involved in that. I just I just want to follow up on a couple of things that I agree with everything Peter talked about. I just want to supplement a few things. I mean, he's correct that in this age of COVID now, these student groups aren't meeting on campus. But that doesn't mean that SJP isn't stu still doing its damage on social media. Um, they are vicious. They are vicious. And it's just as frightening to Jewish students. And in my view, the goal is to shut down Jewish and pro-Israel voices, uh, even on social media. So SJP is still doing its damage in, in this pandemic. Um, as far as what Eric brought up, Eric, we're involved in Duke. Even we've been involved at Duke even before this situation came up. With, with students supporting Israel. Um, SSI is a group that Eric mentioned that's on hundreds of campuses, or I think at least 100 campuses across the United States and in Canada. It's a great group. It's simply a, a pro-Israel group. It's an educational group and doesn't engage in any of the tactics that, that SJP engages on so many college campuses. The student government at Duke actually approved um, of SSI, made SSI an official club, but the president of the student government vetoed that decision, and then that veto was upheld um, for reasons that are so ridiculous. SSI responded to a vicious tweet, probably from an, an SJP member, um, about uh, SSI's um, recognition at Duke. Um, it was a vicious tweet. SSI responded in a constructive and courteous way, inviting this student and the entire Duke community to come to an SSI event and learn more about the group and learn more about Israel. And for that post, the student government president said it was inappropriate and she was vetoing the a recognition of the group. Um, we have written to the president of Duke. It's, it's simply outrageous. Um, this shouldn't stand. And there is a um, there's a in a legal proceeding involving Duke that has been ongoing. It was triggered by ZOA a few years ago, um, where we complained about anti-Semitism at Duke in 2019. Our complaint resulted in uh, Duke entering into what's called a resolution agreement with the government. Duke agreed to take certain steps in compliance with this agreement. It's been in violation. We've notified the government and we have notified the government that SSI is being kept out of uh, kept out of Duke for illegitimate reasons. So the, 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 the case is not over. We're, we're still fighting that battle. Thank you, Susan. Um, if, if I may, I think also that the fact that the decision itself which, of the appellate division, which talks about the coercive and disruptive actions by, uh, by uh, Students for Justice in Palestine is a clear distinction from, uh, you know, any use that this could be uh, put to uh, against uh, pro-Israel groups, which don't engage in those sort of tactics. So if this, yeah. came to, if, if this was a legal case, uh, you know, I think the attempt to to use this case against us would fail because it's just a completely different situation. Um, I also I do want to mention also uh, that the uh, when the case came before the lower court, um, the SJP folks and their allies, uh, including uh, Answer Coalition, Sami Dune, Auda, Al Auda, you know, many of these are groups that call for Israel not to exist. We're all out. We're all, we're all outside and inside the courtroom with signs uh, protesting. They had uh, you know, the fists raised. Um, they were trying to intimidate the court. Um, and I don't. I like to believe that courts don't um, allow. You know, don't don't abide by this sort of intimidation. But then, when you had the shock, the shocking uh, 
decision from the lower court in favor of, of SJP, uh, you know, I, I began to wonder if that was the case here, because they, they certainly tried to intimidate the court in addition to intimidating Jewish students. Um, okay, let's see who else is. Uh, oh, Joseph Flashner, I think you had your hand up. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, so the question now I have is, you know, each borough in New York City has a different district attorney. So the CUNY system, which is, you know, in all five boroughs, you know, including Manhattan, you now have a Manhattan TA, and you must have heard this on the news yesterday, uh, who's going to do all sorts of things when it comes to bail reform and letting people out. So let's say you have a CUNY event uh, in Manhattan, and SJP, do, you know, uh, commits some uh, physical acts of violence and, and, and hurts students. I mean, are we to assume that this district attorney is just going to let these people go? I mean, you know, uh, how, 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 how would you approach this? Well, if, if a SJP member committed a criminal offense, my assumption is that the university would report it to law enforcement and law enforcement would prosecute. I mean, that happened, that happened out in California. Um, Students were, they, it wasn't called SJP at the time. Um, it was another anti-Israel group. It was the, uh, the forerunner to SJP. Um, and they were criminally prosecuted uh, by the district attorney in, in California for disrupting events at UC Irvine. So my assumption is that the same steps would and should be taken if there was a criminal offense uh, that occurred at any of the CUNY schools. Uh, Ken Abramowitz, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, yes, um, I, I just wanted to add a, a further point, which is that SJP is funded by the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood's a criminal and terror organization and is illegal in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the Emirates. So you might, even though it's not illegal here because the Christian countries don't know what they're doing, but the Muslim countries have declared, many of the Muslim countries have declared them illegal. So you might want to add that their, uh, their fa uh, founding father, so to speak, is a professional terror organization that's illegal in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the Emirates. Just an extra arrow in the quiver, so to speak. There's a great report, Ken. You're probably familiar with it. I think it's from 2017. Um, and it was put together by the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. And I think it's called SJP Unmasked. And they talk about, if I'm remembering correctly, they said that SJP gets a lot of funding from American Muslims for, for Palestine. Um, and that the leaders of that group, this report shows, have connections to terrorist groups like Hamas. And that report is available online. I think it's called SJP Unmasked. Sure, sure. But I'm just saying in your arguments, whether it's to a court or to a school, you, you, you should inc include that. It's a, it's a good point. It's a very good point. Thank okay, you. So thanks. thanks so much, Ken. Um, uh, Greta Rafsky, uh, please unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Thanks, Liz. Uh, Susan, my question is for you. I'm curious if any other schools, whether they be um, Jewish departments, academic departments, or deans of students or presidents, do they seek your counsel? Are they aware of your office and what you do, even if they're not going to pursue uh, legal matters? Do they ever ask you what their options are in order to protect the students on their campuses from these harassments and uh, potentially violent situations? Greta, that's such an easy question for me to answer because the answer is no. Mm, the answer that's what I was afraid no. of. Um, the only time that our, um, I wouldn't even say that our advice was solicited, but we raised questions about what was happening um, at the Middle East Studies Center at Penn and to, the, I was happy when the director of this Middle East Studies Center actually invited ZOA to come for a meeting to talk about the kinds of programs that they were, uh, that they were sponsoring, why they were problematic, what ZOA suggestions would be uh, to make these programs more academic and less biased and one-sided against Israel. But uh, we did go to a meeting and we provided plenty of information, but 
we weren't very successful. Thank That's you. a sad commentary. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Greta. Um, we have a question in the chat uh, from Gail Weiss, uh, who's asking, how are you approaching faculty, especially Jewish faculty who look the other way when anti-Semitic activities occur on campuses? And, you know, maybe, you know, you, you might be, you, maybe you could add something about and encourage everybody encouraging students to come forward and speak with us, which is often necessary for these cases. Well, look, there's certainly plenty of Jewish faculty who, who side with SJP. You know, they're often the faculty advisor to SJP groups on college campuses is, is a Jewish faculty member. Um, but we also get contacted by plenty of faculty members who themselves feel afraid to speak up, um, afraid that they're going to suffer negative consequences um, if they take the position in support of Israel. Uh, they're, they're, a, they're a frightened group themselves, and I, and I understand the fear. Um, it meant that we worked with a professor who suffered her own form of harassment and intimidation. We've helped, tried to help professors who've encountered those problems too. So it's really, it's really a problem. I mean, there are, we have worked with professors constructively who have stood up for students, Hillel directors who have stood up strongly for students, but is, it is not an easy thing to do. There, could, there are consequences, negative consequences, not only for students, even for faculty. Thank you. Um, Ruth, Ruth Gray, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Ruth? Thank you, Liz. Um, it seems to me that um, our students have civil rights, and it seems to me that their civil rights are being violated. So then it also seems to me that this should be a slam dunk um, in favor of our students, given that this is a civil rights issue. Ruth, you're right. It should be a slam dunk um, until, I'm proud to say, until ZOA took this issue up. Jewish students did not have the same civil rights as other targeted groups had. Um, as Liz started out by saying, it was, it was ZOA that fought a six-year battle to make sure that Jewish students would be afforded the same civil rights protections that other ethnic and racial groups have at colleges and universities in this country. And it's a civil right that's guaranteed to them under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. So now, we know that, th that this right is enshrined in the law, or at least in the way that the government is interpreting the law, but we have encountered problems getting the government to vigorously enforce Title VI to protect Jewish students. Whenever we raise a problem with a college or university leader, we always remind that leader of the university's obligation to comply with Title VI. Um, and you're right, it should be it should be a strong and vigorous protection, but in our experience, it has not been a law that's been vigorously enforced to protect Jewish students. Thank and you. Just um, Samantha, excuse me, Samantha. Um, oh, did, Peter, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. Um, I, I see the development of um, you know uh, the the, the 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 category of, of being Jewish included in Title VI as a potential game changer here. Um, I actually remember as we were working on our brief, um, that policy came into force um, and we were able to cite it um, in the amicus brief, even though it wouldn't have been you know, relevant to the initial determination of the dean on campus. Uh, but going forward, I do definitely think that that is something we should look forward uh, to having as a tool in our arsenal. Yeah. Um, I see Samantha Von End. Did you want to give the update about Duke, Samantha? I'm happy to. It is uh, just for the people who are interested here. They they claim that the student government has sort of broad discretion in this area. Um, they're not aware if they're going to be able to reverse this decision, but regardless, they've promised to this group the same resources that other student groups uh, receive. In in um, so I, I imagine ZOA working with Duke knows more about this. I was just responding yeah. at the moment. Just to follow up on what you said, Samantha, it's, you know, the university does clearly under its own rules have the overall authority 
over the student government as well. I mean, that's to me, that's an excuse. And the university has offered SSI this sort of separate but equal status. No, you won't be an official student group, but we'll help you out anyway. No, that's unacceptable. SSI deserves to be an officially recognized student group at Duke. And we're hoping to make that happen. Thank you. Yeah, I'm wondering if, if both of you can comment on sort of the double standard here, because if you if you had a group that, uh, you know, sort of a comparable, comparable group to uh, SJP against another group, let's say a group, you know, SJP calls for the death of Jews. I mean, the, the outrageous things calls for intifada, which is the murder of Jews. If you had a group calling for the death of blacks or Muslims or any other group in this country or gays or anybody else, they wouldn't be tolerated for it for a second on a campus and no court in the land, no lower court in the land, no matter how intimidated would ever think of, of uh, deciding a court case in your, in the, in their favor. And can you, can you speak a little bit about that double, double standard? Yeah, I, I, I'm happy to just take the lead here. I mean, this is something we thought about when we were writing our group, right? I mean, you know, if the Ku Klux Klan wanted to create a chapter on a campus you know, there would be no question about uh, gaining them, uh, sort of offering them sanction to, to form a student group. Um, you know, there is a clear line. You don't have to just let anyone in, right? Um, and the question for administrators going forward is going to be, wh- where is that line? Um, and so long as we can make the clear argument, you know, number one, and even if we don't win on number one, um, that SJP is indeed an anti-Semitic group, but even again, if we don't win on that, I think we still have a very clear winner of this group is going to disrupt your campus and you don't want them here. So long as they continue to uh, adhere to the SJP principles, which mandate that they adhere to BDS, which says, you know, not just that you don't want Israel to exist, but that you don't want, you know, Israelis to have voices and places on campus. I mean, it's an actively sort of othering ideology. And, um, you know, I think that uh, we are able to make that distinction that, um, you know, the not, not everyone deserves to have a student group. And SJP uh, is clearly running afoul of the sort of uh, commandments that one should abide by to participate in that sort of uh, capacity. You know, the, the problems um, that could have occurred at Fordham, thankfully, will likely not occur because there isn't an SJP club at Fordham, but we see this double standard when it comes to SJP on so many other campuses. Um, When we complain about the kinds of things that SJP does and says that directly threaten and intimidate Jewish students, we often get the response from college administrators, gee, we don't like it either. Oh, it's awful, but you know what? Freedom of speech, First Amendment, there's nothing we can do. And we come right back at them with several examples of where university administrators have responded forcefully and strongly and punished people who perpetrate hatred against other targeted groups. So why are you not taking the same strong and forceful position when Jews are the targets? And there is a clear double standard on college campuses. And we see it all the time. I encourage all of you who have children or grandchildren on college campuses to please come forward and let us know if there's a problem on a particular campus. And we can't do anything about the problem if we don't know about it. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, We welcome that. Okay, we have the question in the chat from uh, Deborah Glazer, um, who's talking about that in addition to BDS, SJP is against normalization, which leads them to reject the presence of Israeli speakers or pro-Israel events on campus. And, you know, if you could speak about this whole normalization uh, and or anti-normalization issue of SJP, which is, you know, we're not going to norm, we're not going to normalize Jewish students by actually speaking to them um, and having a civil conversation. It, it is the most Um, bullying, the most bullying part to me of of SJP's campaign is this anti-normalization policy where they basically 
are on record saying, we're not going to engage with you. We will actively alienate you. We're going to marginalize you and ostracize you. And this anti-normalization policy was most glaring to me recently in the past few years at NYU, um, where SJP galvanized 50 other student groups uh, to agree to a boycott campaign, not only against um, Israeli academics, Israeli products being, uh, being sold at NYU, boycott organizations like ADL and ZOA, we were specifically named, but they also got 50 student groups to boycott the pro-Israel student club at NYU. So it was basically this massive bullying campaign uh, by students to ostracize their peers simply because they support and love the state of Israel. So what choice do these students have? Do they continue to voice their support for Israel um, and then lo lose their connections to their peers? It was, it's a deliberate, deliberate bullying campaign to silence Jewish students. And it's, um, it, 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 puts, it puts Jewish students in such a painful and in my view, such an untenable position. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say this is an excellent question and, you know, was key to our strategy in putting together our brief um, and should be key to any administrators thinking about uh, considering rejecting an SJP club from forming. Um, because, again, this is what's different here. You know, this is not an attempt to engage in pro-Palestinian and pro-Israel dialogue. It's an attempt to shut down anyone associated with an alternative point of view. And so long as administrators want campuses to be open and centers of discourse, um, you know, they have to think long and hard about whether they want to invite that kind of behavior on campus. And thank you for that. Thank you for that excellent response. Um, just I, I, I noticed that there's yeah, I know sort of one more, but there's a question from Israel Cohen. My, my, my main concern is why is it or how is it that we can more effectively reach out to other uh, administrators in schools to really expose the kind of um, underhanded anarchy that that, uh, that they're being subjected to? We have sent um, letters to hundreds of college leaders across the country uh, at least twice to educate them about the problems that Jewish students are facing and to recommend reasonable and very doable steps that they can take. And importantly, the letters are not just coming from ZOA. We have gotten other groups to co-sign ZOA's letters. These are groups that cross the religious and the political spectrums, but we're all united on this issue to make sure that Jewish students feel safe and welcome. I, I wonder if you can comment on the basic underlying issue that makes SJP um, so convincing and gives them so much power. And I'm wondering if that issue may be occupation. Um, so I, I don't know if that's what, you know, gives them legs or not. I mean, it's hard to say, um, you know, they're very clearly in their position, uh, rejecting any sort of Israel to exist. So I don't think that it's a question of degree with them. I think it's a question of Israel. And I guess, you know, to the point of occupation to them again, you know, they, they could say that the entire land that, you know, Israel sits on and controls and has access to is occupied. So I, I don't know if it's a group that's particularly interested in compromise. Well, what do they use to convince students? How are they so how, how are they so convincing? I mean, they're, they're, they're all over the place and they're doing a great job. So what is it that they're doing that so that works so well? I think one of, the to... things, one of the things that I think SJP is very effective at, and I, I wish we as a Jewish community could do this much better, I see that um, SJP is very good at forming very broad coalitions on college campuses. Um, they form coalitions with black student groups, Asian student groups, 
uh, the LGBTQ student groups, uh, women's groups. And I often ask our campus professionals, you know, who work directly with students on campus every day, I said, I don't get it. How is SJP getting the LGBTQ groups to align with them? I mean, Israel is the is great on gay rights. There's no place better than Israel in the Middle East. So why are these groups getting sucked in and supporting SJP? But unfortunately, that is what is happening. And I think what Jewish and pro-Israel student groups could do a better job at on campus is to build coalitions with other student groups um, to get them to understand and appreciate the truth about Israel um, and get them on board. Um, because I think SJP is doing an excellent job at that. Yeah, I, I, if, I, if I may, I, I would agree also with you know with every, everything everyone said here. But I also, Sam, I think that you're correct that um, you know banding about these lies, you know these false accusations that Israel, which has the right, you know of course has the, the legal and binding right to all of its land, is an occupier somehow. Um, they, they repeat these lies over and over again, sort of these big lies that Israel will not occupy our apartheid, ethnic cleansing. And, you know, all, all of this you hear over and over again. And the students, a lot of the students don't know better. And I think, you know, some of the other uh, Jewish groups don't, you know, ZOA comes out and we tell the truth. You know, we, we, we are very clear that Israel has the right to this land and, and we counteract all of these lies. But some, you know, I, I was just looking at a textbook that, uh, you know, some of, I guess, the reform and conservatives gives to kids and it's called Israel, it's complicated. And they try, they pr- try to present this as two, two equal sides, which it's not. You know, we do have the truth on our side. We did, you know, we, in fact, we did a pro- several programs about that this summer for, for college students, several Zoom programs about this. So to inform them of the truth, that you do have the truth on your side. And, you know, we, you know, will continue to do a lot more of that. But I think I think you hit on something that that's, you know, these lies are at the root of um, what uh, w- one of the things that are at the root of how SGP has succeeded. Liz, um, I just want to throw in also, you know, the lies also are that Israel is this brutal oppressor and the Palestinian Arab people are Israel's innocent victims. These are the lies that SJP perpetrates on campus, and it's very appealing to college students. Uh, It's not true, but it sounds very appealing, and they get sucked in. Thank you again, Peter. Thank you again, Susan, and everybody here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. (laughs) Happy New Year. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.